are recording this, so what I'm going to try and do is, uh, once I've figured it out, I will send you an email tomorrow just with a recording in case you want to see it. But otherwise, it should be on our private Blue Sky Society group. So it's a very relaxed um, and interactive webinar. And as I say, about fun. Um, it's about listening to incredible people like Carl and hearing about the work that they're doing. And then it's also up to you if you've got any questions that you want, want answered. I mean, I'm completely fascinated and, and dying to hear about the work that Carl does. Um, I first heard about Carl from a friend of ours, Dr. Joel Alves. I was asking around for a hornbill group because we've got these incredible neck sleeves that we've been selling. And um, I asked him if he knew of anyone that does amazing work. And without a, a doubt, he told me about Carl. And then a, about a week or so later, there was a little film on um, a little documentary on 5050, which featured you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw it as a sign. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, so a little bit of a, a background about me. My name is Carla Heiser, for those of you that don't know me. And I am the founder and uh, person behind the scenes at Blue Sky Society Trust. It's an NPO that I started in 2012, and it basically raises money for various humanitarian, environmental, and conservation projects. So I normally go on these incredible expeditions into Africa. As I say, for those of you that don't know me, I've got a deep passion for traveling and for our wildlife um, in, in this beautiful continent. But with 2020 being the year that it was, um, I normally take people to go and see the work that these organizations are doing on the ground and interact with them, meet the teams, hear about the work. But obviously with not being able to travel at the moment, um, had to come up with the plan B because um, we always try and raise funds and just tell their stories. So came up with a little web, wild webinar series. So we're going to try and speak to about two conservationists, adventurers, authors, uh, documentary producers, or whoever it is, um, a month just to give you information or just to show you behind the scenes which is quite fun but um, yeah you didn't hear come here to hear me waffling so <laughs> you over to Kyle and he's going to talk a little bit about his project and the incredible work that he's doing. Cool thanks Carla and hello everyone it's uh, it's good to see so much uh, diversity here from people from all over the world it's uh, yeah it's going to be really good. I'm just going to, my name is Kyle, as I've been introduced already. Um, I've been working on the ground hornbill species for oh, just under five years now. Um, I work for the University of Cape Town, uh, who funds the research, and then as well as uh, National Geographic, who we get some funding from as well. And I'm also actually currently conducting my, or well, doing my PhD on the birds. So a whole bunch of things going on with us, but uh, that's very briefly about myself. Um, I'm sure you're all very keen on hearing about what the birds do and what we do to help the birds. Um, so this project, uh, known as the APNR Ground Hornbill Project, started actually about 20 years ago, um, in 2000 to be exact, by the university. And the university pretty much just sent students out to see what was going on. Uh, with this, you know, very elusive species. Uh, they have territories of about 100 square kilometers per five birds or so. So you don't see them all too regularly. So the university sent these, these students out to an area known as, as the APNR. And I'll just, I'll share some pictures with you so you don't have to stare at me and you can stare at, uh, let me just stop that for a second. So, okay, cool. So, Yes, so this is the area known as, can you all see that? Carla, can you see that? Sorted? Can't be. I can see it, yeah, all good. Cool, so this is the area known as the APNR where all the research started and all the research has been going on since. It's in this, uh, this area known as the APNR, which is just a collection of privately owned reserves in the northeastern part of South Africa. Um, it's on the border of Kruger, so it's actually just open with Kruger entirely. Um, and yeah, it's just made up of five different reserves, Baluli, Klesiri, Umbabak, Timavati, and Thornybush. But I mean, this area is massive. It's about 200,000 hectares, so very, very massive, um, massive area. Oh, no. oh, what have I done here? 
That's not right. Sorry, guys. Anyway, I'll just leave it like this. Um, go to view so slideshow. Yeah, this, would that not work? Yeah, it's it's. Let me just do something. Okay. There we go. So yeah, this massive area of about 200,000 hectares, which is really, really big. And they sent these students out to just get an idea of what was going on with, with these birds. And very early on, they noticed that in this area, there was actually a, a lack of nesting sites for these birds. So they decided, okay, well, let's actually, you know, put up an artificial nest or two and see what's, what's actually happening. And they did that. And almost instantaneously, the birds took to them like a moth to a flame and it's it's come with huge success. I mean, the project's been going for 20 years and the population of ground hornbills within this area has almost tripled. So huge, huge success. I do have some videos and pictures, but uh, essentially what happened, they put these new net, these nests up and then as the years evolved, the nests themselves evolved just to try and make the best home possible for them. So now we're starting to see these birds really, really starting to breed. And obviously with them breeding, in these nests regularly, it provides a perfect opportunity for us to research them. So that's pretty much a lot of what we do is we'll, we'll research all sorts of things. Uh, the research early on with previous researchers started more with uh, habitat use and um, territory sizes. And actually even one of the studies looked at the efficacy of, of these nest boxes in conservation. Today, my, my research and my assistant Carrie uh, we're focusing a little bit diff on different things. We're looking more into their group behavior to see how different individuals within these groups actually contribute. So never mentioned before, but ground hornbills are cooperative breeders. So they, they live in these groups of about two to 11 individuals and, in the, and the entire group will contribute to the raising of a single offspring. So our research these days is looking into this group behavior and to see how it actually how the different individuals are contributing and how climate change is actually going to affect their behavior as well as their reproduction. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we will generally be out in the field. Uh, the breeding season of the birds is about from September to, to March. So we will go into the field, drive from nest site to nest site with all these nest boxes, and we will just see which groups are breeding, what they're doing, um, when eggs are laid, we'll measure the eggs. When the eggs hatch, we'll measure the chicks. You can see in the top left there that there's, we're doing some measurements of tarsus lengths. In the right, we're weighing them. And then on the bottom left picture, that's actually just a, period, a picture of the area that we work in. And you can see that we've actually got a pretty good idea of, so all these little polygon things are actually um, the group areas where the different groups live. And then the red dots are where their nests are. So we have a pretty good idea of all the birds in this area. So during the breeding season, our job is pretty much trying to monitor all the breeding that is going on, all the different groups, who's moving where, is there any unusual behavior, et cetera, et cetera. So over the past 20 years, we've seen this population nearly triple. And it's largely because of all this, you know, helping them along the way with providing their sites and allowing them the opportunity to breed. So this is just what it looks like when it hatches. Um, how do you explain this? It's it's. I wouldn't say it's beautiful, but oh, it's shame. It's so definitely cute. cute. It's definitely <laughs> cute. cute. <laughs> the ugly cute. Precisely, yeah. Shame, definitely. No. They look like those little bubble heads that you get on the front of cars. You know, they just they can't hold their heads up, but very cute little things. This is obviously this is a bit a bit older. This is about. 80 days old or 73 days to be old to be exact. Um, interestingly, it takes them about 90 days to leave the nest and they grow to full size in 90 days. So they'll hatch at about 100 grams. And then by the time they leave the nest, they're at about three and a half kilograms. And that's their full size. When you consider that they live to about 50 to 60 years in the wild, they literally grow to full size in 90 days. That's like me growing to this the size I am now in the first 
three months of my life and then that's me done. Then I'm finished. Just very, very unusual. So then a lot of our research these days, as I mentioned, is looking at behavior. So my research is also looking into their vocalizations. Now, I don't know if everyone's or anyone's heard the, the vocalizations of the ground hornbills, but it's this lovely, deep, booming chorus call that they produce. Um, I'll play it for you, yeah. You can see that's an amazing call that these birds produce actually and it's, it travels vast distance, seven, several kilometers that call will travel. So the birds will produce that call in the mornings, every morning, and it's pretty much a means to advertise and defend their territories. So I'm looking at how, how they use these to actually advertise and can they recognize each other, et cetera, et cetera. So from part of the other research is we put these camera traps up at the nest. Obviously with such long breeding seasons, we can't, we can't monitor all the nests all the time. So we put these camera traps up as a means to pretty much see what's going on around the nest when we're not around. And we do get amazing footage. So this is actually it's amazing. It's sad. Eh? Wow. It's 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 sad, but it is, I mean, it's the reality of what happens in the wild. Um, we always expect or suspected that that uh, leopards were part of the reason that the ground hornbill nests fail, but we never actually had concrete proof um, of it happening. So we managed to get get this video of it. It's absolutely insane. Crazy footage. So the bird the, the rest of the group is actually flying around. So that's what the, the leopard was hissing at. It was just flying around the nest and trying to get it away um but yeah i mean like this is this is obviously very sad but this information provides us with information that we've 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 needed really to help you know to know how to better preserve them or conserve them rather this is just a kind of another picture of what it's like um as i mentioned earlier that the whole group will contribute to the raising of offspring so this is a whole group now all arriving at a nest with food and things and then they'll be feeding the chick who's who's inside the nest there again another video this is a much better idea of what's going on <laughs> Um, so this is part, so the other side of my research, we're looking at, at uh, these provisioning rates. So they're feeding rates towards the nestlings. Um, obviously with climate change, things are expected to get a bit hotter, uh, at least in this area. And it's expected that when the temperatures rise, feeding rates actually decrease. So we're looking at how, you know, when this temperature does rise, is it going to get to the point where the adults can actually no longer feed the chicks? So that's partly, it's partly long-term goal of trying to understand how the, the birds might fare uh, in this whole process, but it is nonetheless a start. Another, uh, another little video. This is actually the previous year's chick coming to investigate what's happening at with the new chick. Maybe even steal some food. So with all this research, okay, with so we're obviously looking at a lot of the behavioral stuff and how climate is affecting it. 
it's all working towards the conservation of the species. So we work a lot with uh, another project called the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. Um, they focus purely on the conservation of the species throughout the country and they coordinate all conservation efforts within South Africa. So all our research goals go towards this conservation process and then we contribute towards the conservation process in the way I'm going to explain now. Um, so ground hornbills within South Africa have declined by 70% within the last 100 years. So that's, I mean, that's a drastic decline and it's largely because of ha habitat change and, and loss of habitat pretty much. Um, so the goal for the nationwide conservation plan is pretty much to reintroduce groups into their historic range. And the way we do this is that ground hornbills, I'm gonna stop sharing, yeah. So ground hornbills will lay two eggs five days apart and the second hatch chick will die 99% of the time. So they'll always pretty much die. So what we do with, in collaboration with the, the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project is that we'll go and before that second hatch chick dies, we will take it out of the nest and then it will go to the, we'll take it to the Mabula Project where it will then get reared and then put into a, a new group. So they'll, they will actually artificially form a group and then they'll let them live together for a while, teach each other. I mean, obviously ground hornbills live so long, it allows them to, to bond. And then once the group is old enough, then they will then take them to, to a site where they've, they've allocated and coordinated with landowners that, that allows the birds to live. So then they will release the birds back into their historic range. So essentially what it's doing is just taking it's doubling the breeding success of the birds without affecting the base population. And this has seen huge success so far. I mean, we, we've recently, or actually very recently, we've seen a group of birds that were artificially formed, released into the wild, and they will, uh, they actually successfully bred on their own without any human intervention. And this is, this is the goal. This is the overall goal. If you can reintroduce species and they can successfully survive and breed on their own, then you've succeeded. So we're starting to see the success now and it's just provided that incentive to keep going kind of thing. Because the, the birds take low, so long to reproduce and, and carry on and things, we need this research to kind of understand them, to, to understand the birds better, to help them conserve them. But then because they, they're such long lived species, it's not something that can be done overnight. It's something that needs to just, you just need to keep chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And eventually the population is going to get to that point where it becomes stable again. Um, so this reintroduction program has been hugely successful. And now we're also starting to see uh, successes from outside our study site. So as I mentioned, we started putting these nests up inside the study site. So now we've started putting nests up outside of the study site where birds actually don't occur. And we're seeing natural dispersals from this area. So the combination of, of natural dispersals as well as reintroductions, I mean, we can absolutely get this, this species back on track again. And it's just gonna take that, that, that perseverance pretty much of, of how to go about doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. any questions from your yeah. side, Carla? I want to ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, Go for it. If I'm, sorry if I've missed it. Um, so you say they, they rear the chick, the one chick in a group. Is there like, a, I don't know, sorry if I missed it, is there like a dominant male and female? Is there like a dominant breeding couple or how, how do they work yes. the hierarchy? So, so there's only one female per ground hornbill group in the wild. And she's the obviously- The rest are men. She, the rest are men. And she's the boss. Whatever she says goes. So she lives the life. She gets fed all day. You know, she'll sit in the nest and chill while the, the rest of the males bring her food. And then there is, a, there is definitely a dominant male and they're the ones who breed and then the rest of the, the group will just help them. Yeah. Okay, fantastic, that's so cool. And Carl, why do they have, I mean, the, the eyelashes are so beautiful. Only a female would notice that, but I mean, is that, <laughs> eyes? I mean, what is, yeah, they're just pretty. 
They absolutely are, and it is something, I mean, I get asked this all the time, because they are, I wonder if I have a photo of it, because they are unusually long. Um, let me just have a look here. Uh, I don't think I do have on hand. I can find one, though. Okay. Um, you know, we don't really know. I think it's, I think it's probably because they spend most of the day walking. Actually, I mean, ground hornbills, they spend most of the day walking. So they're spending the day looking at the ground. I think it's just that kind of extra shade almost but okay. I mean it's never there's never been any research into the actual purpose of it okay and Carl I wanted to ask you what what made you go into this industry I mean it's not a, a sexy fashionable bird or species um it's it's quite a different unique one I mean everyone kind of runs towards elephants and leopards and you know rhinos. the sexy species yeah the sexy yeah. ones <laughs> No, I get that. Yeah, um, I don't know. The, the I, I suppose the the unknown about it kind of thing. You know, it's this. I was lucky enough to grow to spend a lot of my years living on on a reserve, and uh, occasionally these birds would come through, and you know they would just peck windows and you know destroy things, and it was you know very unusual. And then I heard about this project, and I just knew that I absolutely wanted to be a part of it. I mean, I didn't. You never really got to see the birds very often. I wanted to get involved. And the whole idea that there's so, there's so little known about this, these birds, and I mean, and the fact that they're endangered in South Africa just absolutely hooked me, absolutely hooked me. And I mean, five years on, I can honestly say that the more I get to know the birds, the more I get interested. The more and more I get interested, it just, it just keeps spurring, spurring me on to find out more. And as much research as we do, I can guarantee you that my list of questions has outgrown the answers long time ago for, <laughs> about these birds. Well, they Definitely. are completely fascinating. I mean, they absolutely it's like they're from a different planet. Um, absolutely. And then, Carl, do they actually have any idea how many? I mean, I know it's an endangered species, but do they have any idea of the numbers left? I mean, or how many they've got in South Africa? In South Africa, it's yeah, it's it is, yeah. predicted that it's about a thousand five hundred individuals, so that's through the whole country. Um, thousand five hundred individuals, so that makes about. It's usually about. It's probably about four hundred and fifty breeding groups. Wow. Okay. Yeah, considering that on, in, in the wild, they'll only successfully fledge a chick once every nine years. Wow. Six to nine years. Sure. So, I mean, yeah, so it's extremely, extremely slow, you know, turnover kind of thing. They're these, these slow breeders kind of thing. Luckily, with the, with the artificial nests that we've been installing, it actually increases their, their reproductive success. So they, we're seeing now successful breeding on average once every three years rather than once every nine years. And I mean, this makes a, this makes a huge difference on its own. Um, and just kind of boosts everything to keep it going. Okay. And and Carl, um, what are the dangers, some of the dangers? Obviously, there's always the human wildlife conflict. Um, uh, I was chatting yeah. with Sue, a friend yesterday, and, she, and I think it was Sue, and she was, well, no, it was Haley, sorry. And um, she was saying that sometimes the, the, the communities, because they don't understand the birds, will throw stones at them. Is there any, like, um, uh, do do our communities see them as a, a danger? You know, sometimes it's like a, around specific species they've got like, yeah. you know, they think no, it's like it's, voodoo it, or something. It definitely depends on, on the culture. Um, a lot of the times, uh, probably the most widespread problem with the, we have with these birds is that I'm sure everyone has occasionally had a little bird sitting on their windowsill pecking at their reflection kind of thing. Ground hornbills are no different. They do the exact same thing, except that they gigantic. Break the window. <laughs> and a peck at the window breaks the window. Oh, and sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's all good and fun, but the birds themselves can get injured. And then a lot of people just get so annoyed by it. I mean, when we've had phone calls from people and they say, no, please come and help us. The birds arrived at someone's house one morning and they broke 76 windows in oh, one go. Word. Wow. Yeah. And then it's a lot of windows. replace the windows and then the next week comes and then the same thing happens. So a lot of the times people just get so annoyed by them. But in terms of cultural beliefs, 
Um, yeah, definitely depends on the culture. Um, some cultures believe that they are the bringers of rain. So if there's a drought or something, they'll try and catch a bird and they'll try and hang it above a riverbed until rainfall comes pretty much. So they believe it to bring of rain. It's also believed that they are the bringers of death and destruction. So that's where probably stones and things will be thrown at them. So if uh, culture believes that they, they bring death and destruction, they'll try and chase them away. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, other cultures believe that they're also bringers of death and destruction, but the only way to avoid that is to ignore them entirely. Okay. So when that's the case, then the birds actually thrive within all these communities. Wow. Mm. Um, very complex. Issue yeah, very complex. Eh? Cultures and things, yeah. yeah. Kyle, can you maybe just talk us through, obviously we're trying to raise a bit of money from you and we hope we've got some amazing humans out there that are going to help us. Um, can you maybe just talk us through your wish list and what it entails and why you need, I mean, I know you need camera traps and a ladder and a scale. Uh, yeah. things like that so maybe if you could just quickly talk us through that and then I know there are quite a few questions coming through that Erin's chomping at the bit in Kenya that's Can great Kenya Erin <laughs> <laughs> you are I'll say that but yeah um, so if you can just chat us through your wish list if you don't mind yeah sure so the wish list is the first one is the camera traps I mean as I mentioned the camera traps are just there for pretty much monitoring when we can't be there. Um, and they have proven absolutely invaluable. It's something we've only started using more recently, uh, probably in the last three years. And the information that we're getting from these camera traps has, has been life-changing. So problem with camera traps is that they obviously deteriorate. Um, they're expensive. We've got a lot of nest. Um, and I can show you, I'll share my screen here with you so you can get another idea of where the issue, the issues are coming in. Let's see if this works. How much do the camera traps cost, Carl? The cameras are about, uh, I think it's 5,000 Rand per camera. Okay. So when and you have, it, we, how long do they last? Going on, pardon? How long do well? As I say, you're trying to show us the video. <laughs> Is that the one where the hornbill picks at the camera trap? Yeah, yeah. So that camera was was one day old. <laughs> oh no! Shame, man. <laughs> yeah. oh, didn't like it. Um, and, but yeah, they're about five thousand rand the camera, um, and then yeah, we pretty much just put them up during the breeding season. They actually, we put them in little camouflage boxes as well to try and hide them. And we put the boxes up well before breeding commences. It was, I mean, in the hope that the birds get used to the presence being there. But this bird in particular found the camera immediately and just went to town on it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the cameras, the cameras are probably one of the most important pieces of equipment that we have. Obviously, cameras, that's on our wish list. The nests as well. As I mentioned, the nests are vital for the success of these birds. And I think the nests are 6,000 Rand per nest. Yeah, they um, are. Yep. Yeah. So the nests, we're constantly needing nests. I mean, the nests themselves are going through constant changes and design changes and things like that in the hope to build pretty much the most indestructible, best insulated kind of thing to promote breeding. Um, we also replacing all nests, all the old nests that we have. Um, old nests used to be all be made out of wood, so now we're replacing them with this. It's like a M1 composite, so it's very hard and a very hard structure that the birds themselves can't break. Other things can't break. They're very well insulated. So we're replacing nests, the old nests, and then as well as that, as I mentioned, with the dispersing birds, we're starting to put up nests in locations where the birds actually haven't been seen in years in the hope that the natural dispersal one bird will disperse find the nest and desire to set up camp there pretty much and try and entice others to join okay and do they make for life was that a 
the theory of it. <laughs> it's, it's difficult to say. It's really <laughs> difficult to say. It's, um, I mean, when something lives 50 to 60 years in the wild, to analyze if, if it's the same birds over 50 years, it's, it's, you need extremely long-term data. Even with our 20-year project that we have now, I mean, we haven't even gone through a single generation of ground hornbills. So it's, it's difficult to say. We know that the, the pairs will stick together for at least 20 years. That we know so far. But anything more than that, it's, it's difficult. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to hand you over to Erin because I know the you know we're on half an hour already, and I know there are quite a few little questions. So yeah. I'm going to hand over to Erin, and she's got a couple of questions um, in the chat and in the Q and A. So I'll hand over to you, Erin. Yeah, thanks, Carl. We've got some really awesome questions that have come through. Um, I'm just in no particular order. Quite an interesting one from Lisa. Carl, she wants to know: Do elephants play a role in the destruction of uh, their habitats? very heated topic when it's always when it comes to elephants and, and habitat destruction um and to, uh, to be honest we don't know but we don't think so that we know for a fact i mean everyone knows that elephants for sure destroy trees pull down trees and things like that but at the same time they create the opportunity for cavities to form so the ground hornbills live in these when they breed naturally they'll breed in a cavity in a tree so with ground hornbill, I mean, with elephants at least, they'll often go past the big tree, rip off a primary branch, uh, and then this, the center of the branch rots and it actually provides a nesting spot for the birds. So they probably do destroy nesting trees, but they also create nesting trees, if that okay. makes any sense. So it's a kind of, um, it, I know one of the projects in this area, Elephants Alive, they also actually looking into this and we are working with them to see if if there is actually any negative impact or what the impact is at all yeah okay um another question do you place um the artificial nests is there an option of placing them not in a tree um and maybe on you know on top of a pole to kind of mitigate any predators climbing into the boxes into the nests there is um but yeah, I mean, there is, but the thing is when you put a pole up, you're exposing it completely to the sun. So we kind of, when it's in a tree, you know, it's usually gonna have some kind of shade in it. Um, that's probably the main thing. Um, plus, I mean, if you're gonna put a pole up, you, with the area we work in, we're in a very natural environment. So you don't want this art completely artificial structure there just for one species kind of thing. And it also provides, Absolutely. while it is in a tree, that nest, when the ground hornbills aren't using it, it provides a nesting site for all sorts of other things. We found genets in there. We found all sorts of owl species, which, I mean, owls could get in regardless of where it is. But, I mean, genets, um, pythons, all sorts of snakes, all sorts of animals use those. So we don't want to prevent other animals from using them. And also, you know, Predators, yes, they are. They do kill ground hornbill chicks, but it's also, I mean, it's 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 so way kind of thing. Yeah, so you don't want to take away a food source from another species, kind of thing. For sure, I think this is a lovely question that's come through. How do we encourage ground hornbills back into our gardens? We are farmers, and in the last four years, we hardly see them around, sadly. Well, I suppose uh, I would ask where where are you farming first of all, um, because that depends on the distribution. I would ask if they uh, were they there previously. By the sounds of it, they were. Um, in that case, it would just be trying to entice them and providing them with the opportunity to breed in your area. Because as soon as the birds have a, a nesting site, they tend to defend it quite quite aggressively so they will as soon as there's a nesting site they will stay in that area and kind of linger around there but bear in mind as well that their territories are massive so so if you can't ex no one can expect really we can't expect the birds to be in one location consistently if it, we've got some groups that their territories are over 200 square kilometers wow. so if that's the size of their territories you, you can expect to see the birds maybe once every few weeks if that 
Okay. And with the groups that are that are within the in their territory, will they will they stick to that area? There's no kind of mingling with the neighbors in you know the certain territories in the reserves. Well, this is this is actually what largely my research is looking at. Um, as I mentioned, the I was looking at their vocalizations. So we found so far that their vocalizations are unique to each group. So they wow. have their own signature calls that they produce. So we're trying to see if how are they communicating? Can they actually recognize one another just by their vocalizations? And will they then, you know, interact with more with birds that they know rather than birds they don't know kind of thing. So it's kind of figuring it out and trying to see. But generally their vocalizations are used for territory defense. So deterrence more than interaction kind of thing. Okay. And yeah. do you have a favorite group that you've got on your database there must be oh, a favorite absolutely absolutely <laughs> and are you allowed to tell us where they are without giving too much away no I, I they're think not watching nice. so they won't be offended if you tell us who, <laughs> who it is <laughs> i'd say it's, it's probably it's probably just from experience with them and time spent with them that they kind of you know you get used to them and just seeing their interactions and in, uh, each of them have their individual behaviors and you can really identify the different individuals it's yeah but i'm not going to give away who it actually is that's okay that, <laughs> that, that's for you to know and then carl just also while we're on the topic of territory um are there are majority all in the greater kruger national park or quite fairly dispersed over um south africa so um Kruger National Park and the Greater Kruger are pretty much the, the stronghold for the population within the country. They'll go all of, they go pretty much all along down the down the eastern coast, but as you move further down, it's much, much more sparse in the territories. And up north in the Lumpopo River Valley, the territories become massive and the birds are just all over the show. But they are around, they're just very rare. Yeah. Okay. And a question coming through here, do they return to the same nesting sites year on year? Yes, yeah. So the one group will stick to the same nest and they will defend them. Occasionally, at least this year, we've seen, we've seen groups come in because these nesting sites are actually limiting factors. I mean, the groups, all these birds want to breed, but if they don't have a nest, they can't breed. So sure. we've seen this year, especially that while a group is breeding, another group comes in and tries to completely take over the nesting site. So they're all oh, trying wow. to fight and vie for these nesting sites. So we're trying to, we don't place hundreds of nests all over the place. They're all strategically placed in a point per group. So we have to try and keep track of each of the groups within the area and kind of provide them with a nest without creating too much conflict between them. Because as soon as we, you put too many down, then there's a lot of conflict and the reproductive success actually decreases. Okay. So it's a you, it's a bit of a balancing game with the nesting site. And do you find that there? There's another question coming through on the chat. Um, is there a higher survival rate with the with the chicks that hatch from the first egg as opposed to the second egg that you guys remove and then reintroduce? The survival rates are actually higher for the ones that we would we keep we take. Um, in the wild, once they once they leave the nest, the survival rate's really low for that first year. It's, I think it's between 30 and 40 percent survival rate for that first year. Okay. When they leave the nest, they are quite are they pretty useless to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> they, they can't really fly. So when the group flies somewhere, they'll just run after them. They struggle to perch. They don't know how Same. to feed themselves. So they. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> Hard. <laughs> Carl, I've got a quick question from Sue, uh, from Chris. Um, do you not run the risk of overpopulating the area with these artificial nests, or um, if so, will the birds disperse naturally? Yeah, so that's that's why I say we we try and make sure. So the previous researcher to me, her whole PhD was looking at the effectiveness of these nesting sites, kind of thing, and she found because she was playing around with this whole thing. And she found that when you put too many nests in the area, then the breeding success actually decreases. So now we very much just stick to our 
dominant groups that we have had in the area the whole time and we provide them with nesting sites and then when there's when there's birds that do kind of one to wonder then they tend to move out of the area itself so we try we try and keep it to pretty much what there is and promote movement outside of the area rather than just this internal thing yeah um, Erin, I don't know um, if you've got any more questions. I know there are quite a few in the chat group, but um, I just see we're nearly going on 45 minutes, so I wanted yeah. to wrap it up. Um, I don't know, have you got anything more from your side? Uh, no, I think we've pretty much covered everything, Carls. Um, and then, of course, if anyone, um, if we have by chance missed anyone's uh, questions, obviously, please feel free to hop on our social media pages and, um, you know, drop us an inbox with any questions that, that we can ask, uh, that we can try and answer for you. Um, and then, I don't know if anyone can just confirm if you guys are seeing any of the links that I have popped up in the chat, if they are um, going to everyone that's participating. Uh, with links to the donation page, uh, as well as the uh, wish list from, from Kyle and the rest of the team for anyone that's been a little extra inspired to, to jump on board. We have raised, okay, so we can't see any links. I think the easiest thing would be to just include the links on the uh, post on Facebook. We are live on the on the Blue Sky Society Facebook page. So as soon as we're done here, I'll hop onto Facebook and drop any relevant links for anyone that would like to make a donation. Um, Carl, I don't know if you want to mention about your buffs as well before we sign off. Okay, I don't know if everyone can see, but we've got, there we go. Grand Hornbill designed buffs by Stephanie. And uh, for the month of February, any sales that we make we normally do 15 rand a buff for any, but for any, uh, for the month of February, we've decided that we're going to double that. And for any sales, we're going to give you 30 rand per buff. That's all. So, yeah. Awesome. So, just a big ask from me, guys. Um, I know in South Africa, we've had a month of no alcohol. So, I'm sure a lot of you out <laughs> there have saved a lot of money, including me. <laughs> so, yeah. Any, any, you know, any donation would be greatly appreciated. And also if you can share Carl's story um, with all your contacts and that, because he's doing the most incredible work. I know there are a couple of questions that we might've missed, but I'm gonna try and send an email out tomorrow with all the different links. Erin's gonna drop everything on social media with the different links. And yeah, thank you so much, Carl, for, for taking up your very busy schedule. I know you are out in the the bush today. I'm very jealous sitting in Durban. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the, the time and for talking to us about your project. Greatly appreciated. I've been completely fascinated to learn more about ground hornbills and I've learned so much today. And yeah, I can't thank each and every single one of you um, for taking the time to join our webinar. Thank you for your support always. Um, yeah, and then we're going to be having our next one on the 17th, Erin, I think. That's correct. Yes. So we're going to be chatting to about pangolins with uh, Nikki Wright and uh, Ray Janssen, Prof. Ray Janssen from African Pangolin Working Group. So that's another good one to, to sign up for and, and look forward to. But Carl, thank you so much for your time to everyone thank you, eh? out there that has been listening. And thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And yeah, we hope that we're going to raise lots of money for you so we can buy at least oh, that would be great. A, a camera trap and maybe an artificial nest and a ladder. I know you need a ladder and a <laughs> yeah, always <laughs> need to get there somehow. Yeah. Thanks so much cool. for, for putting this all together. It's really, I mean, any all awareness is great awareness. Um, I'll send you guys all the links and things, and then you can if you want to post them. And then anyone is more than welcome to. Email me if you have any questions or want to talk about anything. I'm more than happy to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers, everyone. Have a good evening. Cheers, Carl. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.